Uh, hey guys. So uh, up next we have Eva, MBA 2017. Woo! And Eva's fun fact is that over IAP she um, built an entire coffee table from scratch. So what did you guys do, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, on December 2nd, I woke up and I yawned, and I instantly knew that something was really wrong. I kind of stumbled to the bathroom, and I looked in the mirror, and I tried to smile, and I saw this. I, the right side of my face was kind of taut, and the left side of my face was droopy. I managed to somehow convince myself that I'd pulled a muscle, um, and I went to Tate to get some breakfast before class. And it wasn't until I couldn't keep the coffee from spilling out the side of my mouth and I couldn't close my lips around my yogurt spoon that I admitted that I couldn't move the left side of my face. Um, I went to urgent care and they told me that I had Bell's palsy. So for those of you who don't know, Bell's palsy is this super weird disease. It basically makes you look like this. There's this tiny little nerve that runs right under your ear that goes to this tiny canal of bone. That nerve controls all of the muscles on one side of your face, it controls a third of your taste buds, and it controls the little bones that dampen sound in your ear. Sometimes, for reasons that doctors just don't really fully understand, that nerve becomes inflamed, and it swells, and the canal basically cuts off the nerve's function. So that means that you can't move half your face, you can't really blink, it's really hard to eat things, and you're really sensitive to sound. Um, in most cases, there's no treatment, Bell's palsy just eventually goes away. So, obviously, I still have Bell's palsy. Um, this is something that I'm kind of still in the middle of processing. I don't really have a nice story with, you know, a fa fancy bow tied on top, so I hope that wasn't what you were expecting. Um, but instead, I want to tell you about a few things that have happened since I was diagnosed and some of the conclusions that I've drawn from them. So, when I went home from urgent care that first day, um, I kind of assumed that the hardest thing to deal with would be wounded vanity, just like suddenly being way less attractive than you were 12 hours ago. Um, that, was, that was something to deal with for sure, but the thing that really blindsided me was the feeling of isolation. Um, I don't think that I'd ever really realized to the extent to which people think they know who you are based on the way that your face looks. Or the, the extent to which smiles and laughter are the way that people connect with each other, um, or the role that all of these play in business school. Um, I remember going to an, like my final accounting class of the semester pretty, pretty soon after my diagnosis, and the professor was showing this slideshow that was really funny. My entire class was dying laughing, and I was just sitting there aware of the fact that whenever I tried to laugh, my face looked like something from a horror movie. Um, I would walk around campus and people would clearly think that I was, didn't like them suddenly or like wasn't paying attention to them because I wasn't smiling at them. Um, I couldn't go to parties, I couldn't go to bars because they were really loud and they hurt my ear. And I think the hardest thing though was just feeling like if I didn't know someone, they had no idea what was going on. I would walk into, I would walk into stores and the clerk's faces would just suddenly drop um, because I wasn't smiling at them and because we weren't actually sharing emotion anymore. I felt like I was sort of like locked in this little box and I couldn't actually express how I felt to the people around me. Over time, um, I began to realize that this played more of a role in certain circumstances than others. When I was at home with my boyfriend or with some of my close friends, I no longer had to feel like I had to sort of um, control how my face looked. I could just smile and I could laugh and I could trust that even if my face looked really weird, they knew that I was happy. That feeling was incredibly relaxing and so comforting. And I began to seek that out a little more. I think I probably became a little more antisocial. Um, I couldn't always hide inside though. And one of the things that was coming up was interviews. Um, when I first was diagnosed, this was something that I was really aware of. Um, how was I going to go to networking events when I couldn't even really like, I couldn't, I couldn't look normally at someone. Um, I thought about whether I was going to explain to people who were interviewing me, you know, that I had Bell's palsy, um, what was going on. 
And I eventually decided that I really didn't like the idea of making that sort of the focus of what was going on, making that um, the first impression that I had on them. Um, so I decided not to say anything. And in one of my first interviews, I'm sitting there. It's winter, so it's really cold out. My eyes kind of irritated, and I can feel tears welling up in it. And they're getting bigger, and they're getting bigger, and they're getting bigger. And then all of a sudden, there's this fat stream of tears running down my face. Um, and I laughed. And I asked for a tissue, and I said, I'm not crying. I have Bell's palsy, I promise. Um, and the interview continued. And it wasn't really until afterwards that I realized that that would not have been something that I would have been able to do right when I was diagnosed. I would have totally lost it. Um, but because I was confident and because I didn't really let it phase me, um, the interviewer just kind of continued. And that experience really made me realize that connecting with other people, sure, smiles and laughs are really important, but confidence and comfort with yourself go such a long way. And I think the other big thing that I realized is that you can, if you really focus on someone, if you really pay attention to them, that goes an even longer way. And I actually think that some of my connections now are more genuine because I kind of can't just rely on flashing a, a, a quick smile at someone. I have to actually interact with them and understand what's going on with them. So also around this time, I was running a ton. Um, this wasn't really anything new for me. Um, in the fall, I actually ran a half marathon, and I was super disciplined about my training. I did sprints. I had set distances that I was supposed to run every day, set times that I was supposed to hit. Um, and I became really kind of fixated on this idea of meeting my goal, of doing as well as I could. But when I was diagnosed with Bell's palsy, that was just the last thing on my mind. All I wanted to do was just not put on a watch, not even listen to music, just go out there and run. And in the process, I actually kind of remember that I actually liked to run. It's something that I enjoy. And when I was so fixated on my capabilities, on meeting this goal that I'd set for myself, I had managed to forget that this was actually this activity that I picked because it was enjoyable, because I got pleasure out of it. And I really began to think about how many other areas of my life are there where I define myself in terms of my capabilities. And I realized that there are a ton, like <laughs> pretty much everything. I think of myself as someone um, who's smart, who's good at solving problems. Um, but I also thought of myself as someone who had a nice smile. And having something that I thought was intrinsic to me disappear overnight really made me realize that defining yourself in terms of your capabilities is a really, really shaky foundation. I started instead to think that maybe I should think about myself in terms of my passions, in terms of the things that I love. And that was the moment that I dropped corporate finance. <laughs> No, that's true, but more seriously. <laughs> I've always kind of had the sense that I would be happiest as a writer, that that would sort of be like my, you know, my place where I would, I would really love what I was doing. I've always loved reading. I love the act of creating. I love making things. Um, but like probably many of you, I was a kid who was good at a lot of things. Um, and I think that that made me really afraid of failing. Um, that made me afraid of doing anything because I wanted to do it. And I started doing things because I could do them or because other people thought that I should do them or because it was the easy path or the safe path. Um, and so with the two last weeks of January free, I decided that I was just going to give myself free space. I wasn't going to set any goal. I was just going to let myself be creative and see what I ended up doing. And the things that I produced during that time, I'm prouder than them, of them than anything I did last semester. Um, and so I'm kind of excited to see where, where that keeps going, this focus on my passions in terms of, instead of my abilities. So I've just said a few kind of actually positive things that have really come out of this. There are, are still a lot of things that I'm struggling with. Um, I've been having some eye issues, so I get to wear this sexy little number on campus. <laughs> um, I also still really hate taking photos and looking at myself in the mirror. Um, it's really hard to meet new people. It takes a lot of effort. I have to really focus on emoting. Um, and I think most sort of, the most difficult thing to deal with, um, when I went into urgent care initially, they told me that I would probably um, 
see recovery within two to six weeks. Um, it's now at 11, and I saw my neurologist last week, and he told me that I probably won't um, fully recover facial functioning, uh, which is a really hard thing to hear. Um, I really loved my smile. It was a huge part of how I interacted with other people, of who I saw myself as, even of what I valued, of the idea of connecting with another person. Um, but, you know, I think that a lot of the lessons in life are really hard. Um, and when I really think about it, when I really look at it, would I trade what I've learned about myself, about how I really need to think about, how I want to think about what I care about and what I love in terms of instead of what I'm able to do, and how I realized that connecting with other people isn't, isn't just about the way that my face looks? Would I trade that for a symmetrical smile? I would certainly hope not. Thank you.